Prepare yourself for Earthling Entertainment with your hosts, Joe and Ryan. Welcome to another episode of Earthling Entertainment with Joe Wakefield and Ryan Lang. I'm your host who's been sent back from the future to entertain you, Joe Wakefield. I've always been here and they call me Ryan Lang. Hey, hey, guys, so for those of you joining us for the first time, what we do here is a little bit of the spooky, a little bit of the creepy. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's ghost, sometimes it's cryptozoology, <gasps> or a legend, or a myth, but it's always spooky. Mm-hmm. Then the next segment is a little thing we like to call disclosure discussion. That's all about aliens. I'm just asking questions. UFO stories, photos, videos, what is the government been asked to release what have they released are they lying what's going on that's what i'm all about yeah it is (laughs) (laughs) then the latter half of the show is dedicated to the entertainment industry so sometimes we talk about celebrity deaths or we have some movie news or music or video games Mm -hmm. other times we play trivia games but it's all entertainment and those two halves of the show the spooky and the entertainment come together to make our delicious oreo of a podcast Earthling Entertainment. I like to think of it as peanut butter and jelly. Oh, no, that's good. Bring that together. But then what is the bread? The bread is you and me, dude. Holy Snapple. That's right. I think you figured it out, man. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) So, uh, guys, since the last episode, a little event came out called D23. Uh, It is basically where everything that Disney owns tells you about all the new stuff coming out. Now, you got to remember... That's not just kind of like Disney proper. There's also Star Wars. There's also uh, Marvel, the Disney parks. There's a lot of things going on. So most of our entertainment section, we're going to be talking about stories related to those announcements. But uh, something we just wanted to chat a little bit about is uh, the the announcements they made for the theme parks. Yeah, I heard they're going to be taking some stuff out and they're going to be putting in uh, Villain Land. Villain land, so that's like you know, instead of frontier land, we'll get like all the yeah, like a descendants type thing, is there? And that's going to be at Magic Kingdom, okay? So that's Disney World. And uh, then I heard on top of that, they're going to be adding the ride I heard about is going to be like the Monsters Inc. ride. I heard there's going to be like a whole Monsters Inc. place, yeah. So the factory where they make the doors, it's kind of like riding yeah. that the hydraulic lifts for that. You're going through Monsters Inc. Is that our speculation yeah. or is that confirmed? And if anybody's like familiar with like the hanging kind of roller coaster style where like kind of your legs dangle, you know, you kind of sit in the thing and you get strapped in and your legs hang there, uh, that's going to be the first of its kind in Disney World. Oh, yeah, because most of the roller coasters, I remember last time I went to Disney World, this will tell you how long ago it was, their biggest roller coaster was Space Mountain. Okay, but Space mm-hmm. Mountain is still a good one. They still got it. <laughs> uh, I, I would say Rock and Roller Coaster was a good one that they added there at Disney World. I but, See, I uh, never went to that one. I know there was a, there was one in Frontierland that was kind of like mine cars. Yep, yep. That, well, I, I want to say that's still there. Right on. Well, we don't know what lands they're taking out and replacing because it's, uh, is, it, they, is it Monster Inc. land or just the ride? I think it's going to just be the ride. They're probably going to add it to where they already have some Monster Inc. stuff, and that would be, once again, in Magic Kingdom. So it sounds like they're just kind of expanding expanding on Magic Kingdom there. And uh, I did forget also there's going to be a, from the movie Cars, there's going to be a Cars ride. I, ne- well. I never liked Cars, but it's, either. It, that franchise made a lot of money. Yeah, it, it totally went right past me, too. I think we just aged out. I think that's why. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I, well, we were too uh, old, and the kids weren't alive yet, so it just yep. didn't work. Yeah, it just didn't, yeah, it just didn't work out that it just way. just didn't jam. Well, uh, I haven't got to go to an amusement park this year because my kid is too small, and you know it can't really be like, all right, wife, I'm going to leave you with the kid so I can go yeah. ride roller coasters. But I know uh, you went to go to Cedar Point in Sandus- Sandusky, Ohio. That was yes. just this weekend, right? Mm-hmm. And I went there, uh, yeah, just a couple days ago. And uh, I haven't been there in like 15 years. I mean, like, I think the last, like, I went when the dragster was first put up. Oh, yeah, yeah. But I mean, I got to ride it once. Well, Cedar Point was always known for its roller coasters. It's it's like more roller coasters than any other park. Some of the best ones. Right. Like, yeah, we got to ride Steel Vengeance, which is considered to be the number one 
roller coaster on the planet just in in terms of length height speed you know everything it just literally it just beats the rest oh my god and it was it was honestly it, and what i liked about it is it really was a smooth ride these new rides are like in you can enjoy it like but i still <laughs> am i'm just thinking like a car salesman be like no more of those rickety wooden roller coasters you get the smooth hydraulic ride well, we also rode the magnum which is an old roller coaster which has a huge fucking climb and drop and that was that jolted the shit out of me when it was like because you could really feel the difference between these new coasters and the old ones like like the difference between steel vengeance and the magnum is insane fair enough and then uh i know the millennium force isn't that still there yep and it's... that's that one's still i consider to be the the, the scariest in the park for me because you're like barely strapped in <laughs> and it's the highest point in the park and you're in this tiny little car it's like 300 feet or something higher yeah 300 feet Yep. Well, I know the Millennium Force came out in 2000. Uh, the Millennium, go figure. Uh, I was a freshman in high school. I was so I was like 14 in 2001, and that's the first and only time I rode it. Gosh, that was probably around the time that we that yeah I actually did ride rides there. And then they had other really cool ones. Uh, the Maverick was a lot of fun. I liked Maverick because it just shot you into the ride. Like there was no climb, it, no weight. Oh yeah, yeah. It, it was just it was one of those off. ones Oof. where it's just you're basically shot out of a cannon. You just hit, it's like zero to 60 immediately. And that one, that one was sick. Uh, I liked gatekeeper. That was a little more laid back. That's another new one. That one was cool. Rougarou, another new one. That was pretty cool. But Val Raven is another one. I have to suggest to anybody. You gotta go and you gotta get the fast pass. Just it's worth the money. It Fair re- enough. It's it's a lot though, a hundred and eighty dollars. Well, it's nothing compared <laughs> to like some of these Disney parks. If you were to jump back to Disney, you know what was a really good value is when I lived in Hollywood. We I went to Universal Studios Hollywood, which is actually in I believe North Hollywood. But the point is, it was one uh, stop on the train, so I just got a season pass. Which for me, because I was a resident at the time, it was like one hundred and fifty bucks. And uh, yeah, so I got to go with all year and the best times were going in the winter when there was no, there was no tourists right. and I could just go on whatever I want, but they had the full on Harry Potter land oh. and they had a really good Harry Potter ride where you like fly through Hogwarts and then it looks like you're going past the Whomping Willow and they got the mentors flying by and it's all on a hydraulic arm. That's that, awesome. Yeah. That was a really good, cause it, it was a movie studio theater, uh, excuse me, a theme park. So even though Disney is a movie studio, this is a little different. They focus their rides and everything on movies. So it's much, much more immersive. That's so cool, though. I would love to go to Harry Potter land. I'm like not even like that much. into. I I like the the lore of Harry Potter. Well, dude, you can buy a magic wand and like go up to things in the park and like swing your wand and like it, 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 it through youtube not youtube through bluetooth it like reacts and things move and it's magical as hell man you can go have a butter beer at the oh, uh yeah i want a butter beer yeah at the something dragon whatever the i don't remember the prancing. Yeah. actually i think i'm confusing my i pun. was gonna say the prancing pony yeah, is, is Lord <laughs> of the, Rings. the point is you can get a butter beer and then uh they also just opened uh mario it's like a uh, nintendo land and so you could jump on blocks stuff like that that was Yahoo. i missed that i i had moved uh, back to Detroit at that point. But uh, my favorite thing was the Jurassic Park ride. Ooh, nice. Which was the classic riverboat Jurassic Park ride that there always was. But then when Jurassic World came out, they updated it. And they actually did some fun stuff. They incorporated the uh, the giant underwater shark type thing that was a big star of that oh, 2015 uh, film. Oh, my gosh. Yes, the, the, swim, I, I, the I, swimmy sore, you know, yeah, right? I know exactly the one. It's like one of my, uh, the Mosasaurus, I believe. Yes, the Mosasaurus, the one that got all the two animals and put on a boat and saved us all from a flood. That's right. Yeah. 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 That and, was a good uh, movie. <laughs> the, what, what's funny is they actually made the Mosasaurus like three times as big as they really were, but they still, the, the Mosasaurus that funny. That still be terrifying. But yeah, fun fact, like, yeah, they're really not reptiles. They're really not amphibians. They're kind of like in between. And they literally, we have found their skeletons all around the world. Oh, yeah, dude. Ocean. And they, yeah, and they <laughs> were like during a couple periods, like they were, they ruled the fucking seas for a long time worldwide. Well, there's no saying that they don't still exist maybe in the Miriana Trench, like that movie Meg 2, yeah. The Trench. Yeah, you never know, man. Meg 2 was so bad. Meg 2 was bad. It was so bad. Like it was like they, they knew. 
Like it was like they were almost trying to make it bad. I, I want like, to remind you, Ryan, that the Meg is based on a book series that has several books where the shark does fight a T Rex in the book series. So good. as bad as these good. that movie may be, it might have been a very faithful adaptation. I don't know. <laughs> All right, guys, with with that nonsense, we're going to jump into our first segment, which is, of course, spooky stuff. But uh, I want to mention that we are actually covering because I new thing. I'm going to just say what we're covering before we jump in. It was a request from one of our listeners. Uh, So we're doing the Scottish Red Cap Goblin here on this week's spooky stuff. Red Caps for the unwary visitor to their lair. Red caps can be deeply dangerous creatures. These malevolent little folk are classified goblins. We little folk. And that's a word that's rarely attached to anything positive. While well, they... hold on, hold on, hold on. The green goblin is very positive if you are a fan of destroying Spider-Man. So, for that's instance, true. J. Jonah Jameson, yeah. big fan of the green goblin. Yeah, <laughs> it's all about perspective. That's all I was trying to say. Thank you. Very, very, very good point, Joe. Thank you. (laughs) While they do appear (laughs) in Northern European folklore, they're most often found in border folklore. In many ways, it's hardly surprising. The border region is a particularly blood-soaked part of the British Isles. The land was contested for centuries, though the red caps appear in the castles in southern Scotland rather than in northern England. Yes. So uh, way back when, Scotland, England, they even had a wall separating the two. You know, they've always been fighting. So those castles, those outposts kind of, you know, kind of like making that divide. These are the castles that we're talking about. A lot of fun ruins. Yes, yes, I would like to visit these castles. Actually, I just don't want to meet a red cap. But... Yeah, I want to visit them too, but th- from what I hear, these red caps will Fuck you. I was about to say, they will mess up your day. Apparently. (laughs) According to Sir Walter Scott, Redcap is a popular appellation of that class of spirits. Apparition. Oh, sorry. We got a typo here. Just start over. According to Sir Walter Scott, Redcap is a popular apparition of that class of spirits, which haunt old castles, every ruined tower in the south of Scotland is supposed to have an inhabitant of the species. Since they're so dangerous, let's find out more. It's important to know. The more you know. According to 19th century folklorist William Henderson, redcaps live in the string of ruined castles stretching along the border between England and Scotland. They favor the castles that saw violent or tyrannical events, in which many ways should be most of them. Yeah, it was, they were not nice to each other. <laughs> Some believe the Red Cap's name comes from his tendency to soak his cap in fresh blood. Hence his alternative name, Bloody Cap. I think Bloody Cap sounds a little bit more badass. I'm, I'm sure that these goblins don't get to choose what other people call them. I mean, a lot of people would like if you could choose what people call you, but I like Bloody Cap, just saying. I'm down for Bloody Cap. Yet... This bloody cap proves to be a weak spot for the red caps. They can't let the blood dry out, because they will die if it does. This apparently explains the glee with which they kill. <laughs> scary, 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 scary. Get out of here. You know, you know, yeah, that's a bad red cap. <laughs> but where they find a steady supply of victims living in ruined castles is anyone's guess. Henderson even describes them. He is depicted as a short, thick-set old man with long, prominent teeth, skinny fingers armed with talons like eagles, large eyes of a fiery red color, grisly hair streaming down his shoulders, iron boots, a pike staff in his left hand, and a red cap on his head. All right, I want to focus a little bit on the iron boots. That's crazy. That and you know, I, I'm imagining kind of like a uh, Iron Maiden type thing, like a cage on their feet, rather than like you know, a a a shoe that's metal. Oh, that would piss them off. That would explain why they're ticked. Yeah. Well, imagine like, getting... my feet hurt, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, imagine getting curb stomped with an iron uh, boot, man. Uh yeah, yeah. 
but bite the goblin curve, dude. Oh, shit. oh, God. Ah, goblins. Got to watch out. I didn't think you're going to go dentist. Don't want to go down that road. It's red caps down there. <laughs> <laughs> the red cap would throw stones at anyone who tried to shelter in one of his castles, and where possible, he killed them. He dipped his cap in their blood to keep the blood fresh. Taking on a red cap is never recommended. Despite their iron boots, you'd be hard-pressed to outrun one. Only two possible defenses pop up, even often in folklore. You can either quote the Bible at him or hold up a cross. Either of these actions should drive him away. If you're successful, the red cap disappears with a yell and a flash of flames and leaves behind a large tooth. Huh. Interesting. Perhaps. The Wait, mean, did, did the tooth grow back? Or is every time one banishes, they lose another tooth? And eventually oh. you're going to get a red cap going, ah! Ah! You, <laughs> son, you son of a bitch, I'll kill you! <laughs> I will scratch you. I still got my claws. Oh, that could be a bummer, man. Yeah, well, yeah, it doesn't sound like a good life to be a red cap. Yeah, I don't know. I don't carry around a cross, and I don't know scripture, so that also could be an issue. I was going to say, like, maybe they just don't like it. They're just like, ah, god damn it. Like, what, what if we could do creative license? Like, it's whatever scripture to us. So you could just pull out some, like, Zelda or Star Wars myth, and it'd be like, oh, no, scripture! To his, in his heart, it is scripture. A hundred years in the future, Link is Jesus. Hell yeah. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> you can either quote the Bible at him or hold up a cross. Either of these actions should drive him away. Like I said, I'd be screwed. Perhaps the main legend about a red cap concerns Hermitage Castle. Lord Solis, that's a cool name, yeah, was cool name. no ordinary landowner. Apparently, he practiced the black arts and was a keen sorcerer. Jay Levden describes him following a local tradition as uniting every quality which could render strength formidable and cruelly detestable. Don't hold back there. Yeah, they really didn't like that guy. As part of his sorcery, he con conjured a red cap as a familiar. Ooh, that's kind of cool. I mean, some people have cats or wolves. This guy's like, now fuck that goblin. Well, yeah, like, you know, in Oblivion and shit, you could summon, like, the little goblin creature. I forget what they're called, but yeah, like, you can summon familiars and shit like that. Yes, but this supposedly happened. It wasn't a video game. I believe it. I believe it. Why not? It came from somewhere. Some tales name him Robin Redcap, but William Henderson refers to so, him as Redcap Sly. So Robin Redcap or Redcap Sly is the familiar. Right. That's his name. Cool. Either way, Red Cap Sly rampaged around William's lands. Sir Walter Scott collected a Scottish ballad about the pair, and in it, Robin lives in a chest and enchants William. Hmm. The Red Cap noted that he'd have a charmed life, and he'd be impervious to lances, arrows, swords, and knives. Only three ropes made of sifted sand wrapped around his body would be his downfall. Okay? It's interesting that the Red Cap only seems to consider bladed or pointed weapons as potentially dangerous. Whether this is due to their being composed of metal, given their fairies' general dislike for iron, it's unclear. Oh yeah, fairies hate iron. They do. Yeah. They do. And, Which and makes sense, because a lot of these stories came out during the Iron Age, so, you know. <laughs> they hate iron. You know, silver is obviously the classic, right? So maybe that, that because, I don't know, because silver was always the one against werewolves. I mean, I think the the and metals is just. It's, just it's metal in general, it, yeah. It depends on the metal, right? You're like, damn it, you got like this sword or knife, and it's like four different things. You got all right, a gold, no, no, copper. I don't know, what are you allergic to? Iron? <laughs> which, <laughs> like, one, which one am I going to stab you with? Hold on. I'm imagining like the sword giant it's, Swiss army knife. With, or like, like a the... ring of keys with little <laughs> knives on them. <laughs> Like, hold on. It depends on who uh, mystical creature we got to be a stabbing. It's like, I've stabbed him ten times. Have you tried copper? Shit. <laughs> I forgot copper. It's like, <laughs> the one time I didn't bring it. <laughs> you dumb bastard. <laughs> you dumb bastard. You'll never catch me. <laughs> In the legends. Rock. <laughs> <laughs> In, in the 
legends, Lord Sol <laughs> does indeed meet his end in a most grisly fashion. Oh yeah, dude, this is fucked up. He was boiled to death in a cauldron at Nine Stain Rig, a nearby megalithic circle. Red Cap Sly is unable to save him since his captors don't use metal weapons. But yeah, it's funny. Uh, and you're about to read it, but I, I just want to tell you beforehand. So apparently the king got sick of hearing people bitch about this guy. And he's like, dude, I don't want to hear about any whatever. Just boil him alive or whatever. And he wasn't serious, and they fucking did it. <laughs> like, that's... What, he just went to go get, a, like, a fucking beer? Like, I mean, and then, just then re- he... read it. Just read it. <laughs> like, uh, comes back from the pub like, whoa, 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 oh, oh, I was... Shit. <laughs> Levton also claims that Robert Bruce condemned him to death by saying, boil him if you please, but let me hear no more of him following repeated complaints about William's outlandish behavior according to this version of the legend Bruce dispatched riders to prevent the execution from taking place after realizing his words had been taken seriously they were too late <laughs> yeah, can you imagine though uh, I, if you just I was just some guys laughing. just like oh whatever man shoot him in the foot you're like wait what what they wait. pull you away and actually do it Oh, God, I wasn't serious. Right. I you mean, can't make jokes if you're the ruler. Right, yeah. And, you, and like, at least with the foot, you can walk up and be like, sorry, man. Yeah. You know what? I just, you know, I just kind of, that was off the cuff, and, and they like, took me ooh. seriously. So, honestly, if you want anyone to blame, honestly, it's their fault. They, they you know, they should have read the sarcasm. I was laying it thick. Well, if there's any <laughs> ruler, right, that tells you to do something, you can't really not yeah, do You don't it. question it. Yeah, but like, art. Are you serious? You want me to? All right. All I right. guess we'll get working on a big pot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dude, it's just, just a man. Like, and they just like have him stay in there. They're just stirring this pot. Like, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Please let me out. It's sorry. It, this hot tub. Why are you putting carrots in the hot tub? <laughs> I was going to say, like, you know, we want it. We, it's going to, it helps with the smell. Look, it bud, helps with the smell. I'm not going to lie to you. We're not going to let that beat go to waste. <laughs> and you know what? I mean, you ever, yeah, you ever smelt fresh boiling human? It's not great. It's not great. Oh. It's like, Meanwhile, the red caps just sit there watching, going, "Oh shit!" <laughs> and and there's no metal weapon, so he can't help. Is what it said. Oh yeah, because they don't. They only consider bladed weapons a threat. Right, but I mean, a cauldron would be cast iron. Yeah, it's not a weapon though. But I guess the weapon is. The I mean, you could water. drop any heavy metal object on someone's head and kind of be a weapon, kind of Looney Tunes style. But you know. Yeah, the real weapon here is the boiling water. <laughs> <laughs> and the uh, whims of a crazy person. Like I- I'm just seeing Bugs Bunny now. Sorry, like I'm just like I'm gonna make wabbit stew. Sorry. You can still visit Hermitage Castle, historic environment. Scotland cares for it, and it's open. Between the 1st of April and the 30th of September. It's also believed to be haunted by Mary, Queen of Scots. Yeah, just throwing that in there. Also yeah. also haunted by her, just saying. A little bit haunting. Yeah. Of course it's haunted. And by all accounts, it is haunted. Henderson notes the parallel existence of the Dunter or Powry in similar border ruins. These noisy sprites make sounds like beating flax. Apparently, if the sound goes on longer than usual or is louder, it predicts a death. Yeah, but that's all up to d- interpretation. Like, oh, I think it went longer that time. Someone's going to die. Someone's yeah. going to die. It was way louder, I swear. It's like counting, yeah, like counting the time between lightning and thunder. You're counting your doom. The Picts who built the border castles used human blood to purify the foundation stones. This grisly act created resident ghosts in the buildings. Some wonder if the spirits of these sacrifices take the form of redcaps or dunters. If so, it would be interesting to know how Lord Solus managed to conjure one as a familiar. You know, that is always a cool concept. Like, basically, a ghost or a spirit has to take some kind of corporeal form, and they take a form of, like, a monster, in this case, a redcap uh, goblin. Uh, that's very uh, Japanese RPG video game. Yeah. Like, I played a lot of Final Fantasy games. I think it was Final Fantasy 13. 
where when people die, they turn into what's called fiends, and it's like exactly like that. Makes sense. Red caps pop up ev- elsewhere in folklore, as folkloric creatures often do. While the border red caps favor blood and destruction, the Perthshire red cap in Grantley Castle showers anyone who sees them with good fortune. Vampires.com say red caps also. Vampires.com. 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 Also, well, that's not a commercial. I just think it's funny that there's vampires.com. They say red caps also appear in Ireland, calling them the vampire's cousin. They also what say. Up, bro? What up, bro? What up, though? Also, they also say the cap is made from dried human skin. See, that's a fun little thing. You know, if the goblin with a human skin cap that he has to soak in human blood. Hmm. Rough. Is that a <laughs> scrody coat? Jealous. South Park reference. Red caps are by far some of the most malicious creatures in folklore. That's saying a lot. They're little pricks, I'll <laughs> tell you what. He's a dick. Those guys are fucking asshole. Don't be a dick. Be a dude. Come on, red cap. At Come on. Least, <laughs> at least in the British Isles, by the way. Luckily, their association with ruined towers and castles mean that reports of them are few and far between. Because let's face it, how many ruined towers and castles are you going to? I don't know. I don't live in the United Kingdom or Scotland. But I imagine if you live in a country where there are many ruins of castles, that visiting them isn't that big of a deal. To you. I was going to say, I would probably go check them out. But yeah, if you live there, it if would you be live like, there, just be oh, um, like, yeah. oh, well, yeah. Yeah, it's like oh yeah, it's like you know going to the Great Lakes in Michigan for us. It's just like yeah, they're yep. there. Yeah. Yep, they're there. Yep, yep. Mm-hmm. used to it. That's a lot of fresh water there. You're right. Mm-hmm. 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 Ruined mm-hmm. castle. Plus, yep. you know they're the damn red caps. Oh fuck those red caps! They're I hear they're douchebags. <laughs> <laughs> this does, of course, raise the possibility that red caps became cautionary tales to warn travelers away from lonely locations. After all. This was a violent part of the country where you could encounter threats other than red caps. Still, if you find yourself in the presence of a red cap, don't try to run. Hold up a crucifix if you have one, or make one using two long objects, Peter Cushing style. Referring to the vampire movies he made in the 70s. Yep. Quote scripture, if you know any. I don't. (laughs) <laughs> Jesus I loves I me This I know <laughs> For the Bible tells me so like, <laughs> It would be something so stupid like that right. Be like Art uh, Art projects in heaven <laughs> And Chelsea's Toasty's Toast That's like the only shit I remember <laughs> With any luck Jesus is good Jesus is good Jesus is great don't fucking kill me. What did Cartman say? I want Jesus inside me. Like, <laughs> with any luck, he'll disappear and you can come back here to tell us all about it. Yep. We'll I, see. We'll see. And that's what we're talking about, Red Caps, on this week's Spooky Stuff. That was now, some good spooky stuff. I like Scottish folklore. I do, too. And if there's anyone out there who has a story about Red Caps, if it's a legend you want to tell or a first-hand encounter, that would be amazing. Hit us up. We'd love to talk to you. We have a new email, earthlingentertainmentpodcast at gmail.com. That's right. Best way to contact us, earthlingentertainmentpodcast at gmail.com. That's right. I... Uh, and also, obviously, on Facebook, if you guys have us on Facebook, that comes, like, right up on our shit, too. So you can contact us there as well if you don't feel like doing the email. Earthling Entertainment Special Report. So Netflix is developing an animated Ghostbusters series. So if you're a fan of Ghostbusters, you might want to check that out because the last movie didn't make that much money. So if you want another movie, you got to support the franchise. So check it out on Netflix. This has been an Earthling Entertainment Special Report. I ain't afraid of no ghost. What? Excellent. Now let's jump into our next segment, which is all about aliens, called... Wyatt's Disclosure Discussion. <laughs> it's about aliens and stuff. New play to be based on 1960s UFO sightings. This comes to us from BBC.com. A theater company is researching reports of UFO sightings in Stroke on Trent on 2nd of September 1967 for a forthcoming play. Clay Body Theater said there were dozens of reported sightings of flying saucers and bright lights in the skies above 
Bentley, the company's artistic directors, Conran Nelson and Deborah McAndrew, are now looking for stories about the incident. They want locals to come forward with their memories of that night, as well as more general stories about life on the Bentley estate today. Miss McAndrew said she came across archive footage of the incident and found it fascinating. It's riveting, she said. At first, you'd think it's almost a spoof. It's so specific to its time. A UFO is such an interesting thing, especially when it's got multiple witnesses. Two days after the incident in Stroke on Trent, six saucers were found in the Isle of Shepe. For a time, members of the public, police, and the army believed alien spaceships had landed until these were revealed to be a hoax by students. Speaking about the unexplained incident in Bentley, Miss McAndrew said, I can't find anyone to explain what it was. That doesn't mean there isn't a rational explanation. But it was the 1960s, and there was space fever around. And everyone was on acid. <laughs> the best stuff, too. <laughs> With the space race, it was a hotbed. Uh, so she said the Bentley was often the butt of people's jokes, but she wanted to try to tell the story of what was experienced there in a different way. She said the field where people say they saw the UFO land is pretty much unchanged and that she is open-minded about the responses that she will receive. The play's working title is Bright Lights Over Bentley. Yeah, that's a pretty good title. I like it. And uh, Miss McAndrew said it would be based in science fiction, but would likely weave in local influences. I've got some characters already starting to emerge, she explained. She added there was a significant Giordi population in the area at the time. Because a lot of miners from the northeast of England came to work in the Berry Hill Pit, it was possible, she said, there would be a character built around this in her play. There's lots of interesting insights there, and a character is coming through now. The creative process can sound a bit pretentious, but gradually characters can take shape as you talk to people. Rehearsals will start over the summer and the play will open in September. Awesome. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. You know, basically taking the local folklore, making it, you know, weaving in actual accounts and stuff, and then not being bound by truth, being able to speculate because, you know, like she said, she's, she's making it like science fiction. So that means we're probably going to have an alien character and they're probably going to talk to people. And I don't know. I'm, I'm down. I'm down. I like. How, how many plays do you know about? You know, like flying saucers, aliens and shit. Like, you know, that you don't really hear them any. Yeah, only three. Okay, see, I can't even think of one. <laughs> Fair enough. Give me one. <laughs> uh, let's, let's not try to do this right now. Because <laughs> to be perfectly honest, I don't remember the exact titles. But I believe you that they exist. I'm just saying, like, I can't even think of one. Like, Fair so, enough, yeah. yeah. So that's very cool. Yeah, I that's don't know. very cool. Uh, Ryan and I met, believe it or not, the year before sixth grade in acting class, and we have done many plays together. So that's right. Uh, the uh, the the stage is always something I love, even though I don't do it anymore, and I don't <laughs> think that's in my future. It, it it was in my past and helped build who I am. You too, bud. Hey, we might make dumb videos. We might make. A cool movie someday. Who knows? Yeah, neither one of those is a play, though. I'm talking about doing a stage play at some point. That would be actually kind of really interesting. You know what? We should get together and do a musical at some time. I'm down. All right. Well, that's a lot of work, so we'll see if anything comes from that. But anyways, guys, we have a special thing. Another disclosure discussion. Ooh, ooh. That's right. Here we ooh, go with ooh, part discussion. two of disclosure ooh, discussion. Ooh. Mysterious monolith appears on Welsh hilltop. This comes to us from BBC.com. A mysterious monolith has suddenly appeared on a hilltop in Powys. The gleaming silver structure was spotted by walkers on a bluff near the town of Hayon Wai on the weekend. Sprouting up out of the mud and measuring about 10 feet tall, its discovery has led many to take to social media to question who put it there and why. 
Some have pondered whether or not the object could be of extraterrestrial origin. I would love for it to be an alien monolith. Be like 2001 A Space Odyssey. It's, it's going to help tune us in to the next the like development of man. It does look pretty alien-like. Local builder Craig Muir said he was taken aback when he spotted what he assumed was some sort of a UFO while out hiking. It seemed like a very fine metallic, almost like a surgical steel, he said, describing the monolith, a large single upright block usually made of stone. It looked perfectly level and steady despite the weather being windy. Since there is no way to drive up to the top of the hill, Mr. Muir suggested it could have been taken there by a group of people or dropped into position by a helicopter. It didn't seem... Or a UFO. Or a UFO. Or it was just dimensionalized there, just... No, no, it was UFO. It didn't seem like it was chucked in there. Instead, it has been accurately put in the ground, he said. However, there were no obvious tracks around it, and no one would think that something like that would cause a lot of mess. This is not the first sighting of a mystery monolith. No, it is not. Just days after its disappearance, another monolith appeared on the Isle of Wight. Similar structures have been seen in Cornwall and a few isolated parts of Europe. One even popped up on top of Glastonbury Tor, an area steeped in Celtic mythology, inscribed with the words, not Banksy, on the side. Well, see, that makes me believe it wasn't aliens. Cause yeah, it, yeah. Because yeah, it says not Banksy, but Banksy's a street artist, right? So it, it would be like, no, no, I did this, not Banksy. Be like, and, All right. And these monoliths look different, if this is the right picture, than the other monoliths that I'm familiar with, because the other monoliths had a, a circle uh, in the top center, like, like a, a hole, a giant circular hole through it. Well, I think it's going to, this situation, this phenomenon is going to be a lot like crop circles, right? Where maybe right. there are some mysterious monoliths and maybe some are man made and we'll, you know, you got to separate the two. That's honestly where I was going to go with it, too. I'm glad you said that because, uh, and I feel, and it's funny that the monolith is, is actually so popular in culture. Uh, my girlfriend and I were playing Sims 4, and I'm an astronaut in the game. And literally, when I got to like my next level, one of my things I was rewarded was the monolith. The monolith. I'm sure that was a 2001 reference. Yeah, yeah. So I thought that was actually kind of cool. That is very cool. So I guess that brings us to... Music Bubbles. The Bedlam of the Board. This comes to us from Loudwire.com. The Mars Volta discovered the power of the Ouija board. The hard way while recording the Bedlam in Gotham album at Hollywood's Ocean Way Studios. Kerrang reports that the group members had been experimenting with an Ouija board, trying to converse with the spirits to gain inspiration for their recordings. But as the sessions began, some issues started to plague them. The band split with their drummer, singer Cedric Bixler Zavala, had to re- relearn how to walk after undergoing foot surgery, and the group's engineers suffered a serious nervous breakdown. Yeah, these are all the things that happened after they started fucking with the Ouija board. You don't fuck with those Ouija board, man. I'm not going to help you make this record. You're trying to do something very bad with this record, the engineers said before exiting the project, adding, You're trying to make me crazy. And you're trying to make people crazy. You know, you always hear that, like those fun little uh, stories that are either on you know, Twilight Zone or something like that, where it's like a musician finds like the perfect music that if you play it, it unleashes a demon or it, like they say, drives people crazy. Or you like, know not what you mess with, motherfucker. <laughs> After that incident, the studio flooded. Some audio files went missing and misery loomed over the sessions until guitarist Omar Rodriguez Lopez snagged the Ouija board, broke it in half, and buried it in an undisclosed location. Yeah, I also set it on fire. I heard that didn't help shit. 
<laughs> I'd actually, I don't know. They're all really depressed and like, plagued with demons now. So good job, Mattel. Well, I mean, who you, makes Ouija that's boards? That's so <laughs> true. It's literally just owned by some. It, that's what I always laugh. At. Don't get me wrong. I think Ouija boards are cool. I love the folklore, but it cracks me up how seriously people take a thing that is quite literally owned by a toy company. A toy company. Well, I don't. I think it's that whole thing where it's not what it's not what the actual object is. It's the power and belief you put into it. You know what I mean? Correct. And, and you know, it's, <coughs> that's something I think we who love paranormal, UFOs, the unknown, have to always be ready for, right? There could always be an explanation, you know, like... It's okay to be a skeptic, but you also got to be open-minded. And remember, the brain is stronger than we think, and manifestation is a thing. Yeah, there it could always just be... You think you saw it. It really, I hate to but say if that. If you think you saw it, maybe you saw it. Maybe the fact that you, it's like Schrodinger's, excuse me, Schrodinger's cat, man. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? Yes, yes. Uh, and like I said, I'm not, I'm just saying that sometimes you really want to see it. And sometimes you do see it. Right. And that's like how I feel about my little UFO sighting that lasted like a, a split narrow of a second. <sighs> was I know I want to see it so bad. So that's another factor in which I'm, I'm, I don't know, I'm skeptical of myself. Don't explain it away, man. You called me right after it happened. And I you, did. You were convinced I you was. saw that UFO. I was. I really was. All right, guys, so we got a number two of Music Mumbles. Here's another mumble for you I about like this, music. I like this band. Do not engage. This comes to us from Loudwire.com. <laughs> Kill Switch Engage have their own haunted recording story that took place during the sessions for The End of Heartache at Zing Recording Studios in Westfield, Massachusetts. Guitarist slash producer Adam, oh, I'm going to butcher this, forgive me, Dukkiewicz, told Revolver. Dukkiewicz? I'm going to stick with Dukkiewicz. Dukkiewicz. Revolver, told Revolver that during his time there, he experienced some creepy encounters with the studio manager's deceased father. One night, he had a seance to talk to his father because he and his dad still had some unsettled business. He thinks ever since then that his father's ghost won't leave. It's really weird, says the guitarist. Oh, it's always tough when an elderly parent won't leave the house. <laughs> <laughs> God damn it, Dad! Leave me I'm, alone. I'm not going in a home. Quit messing with the temperature. <laughs> Dutkowicz reported seeing crazy lights and floating orbs. While drummer uh, Justin, Foley, Justin Foley spotted shadows doing things that shadows don't normally do. <laughs> <laughs> I guess it could go there. Joel Stroetzel may have had the creepiest experience. He felt someone brushing against his arm and heard someone walk through the room while he was napping, only to wake up and find no one there. It creeps you out, said the guitarist. Okay, but in that last guy's case, it sounds like there was just a creeper in the house. You know what I mean? Like a housekeeper just like, oh, he's so famous. I no. want to touch his arm. <laughs> no, it, it's a ghost. It's, it's a, a ghost. ghost. It's a ghost. <laughs> you know, in my head, for some reason, that was a cartoon mouse. Like, I don't know why. Like, when I was doing that voice in my head, it was like a Looney Tunes cartoon mouse. All right. Yeah. What would you name him? Celestro. Celestro. Yes. Celestro, Cilantro, Bergenstock. Celestro, Cilantro, Bergenstock. Yes. Copyright. Earthling Entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Oh, I guess moving right along. In, you know, sometimes... In life, people die. It happens. I know. It does. Don't, don't mean to get dark here. And sometimes those people have worked in the industry and done art and created things that we all enjoy. And when that happens, we sometimes like to, uh, to basically give them their due. So here is our segment we like to call... Remember that guy? Remember that gal? Well, now they're dead. Susan Wachkiki. Former YouTube CEO and influential uh, influential Google exec dies at 56. It's young. It is. This comes to us from Variety.com. Susan, Wa Susan Wachkiki, 
who served as CEO of YouTube for nine years during a period of massive growth for the video platform and was one of Google's first hires, died on Friday, August 9th. She was only 56. I consider that very young. That's that crazy. is very young. Watch Kiki's death after a two-year fight with cancer was announced by her husband, Dennis Troper, in a public post Friday evening on Facebook. It is with profound sadness that I share the news of Susan Watchkiki passing, my beloved wife of 26 years and mother to our five children left us today after two years of living with non-small cell lung cancer, Ugh. Troper wrote in the post. Susan was not just my best friend and partner in life, but a brilliant mind, a loving mother, and a dear friend to many. Her impact on our family and the world was immeasurable. We are heartbroken, but grateful for the time we had with her. Please keep our family in your thoughts as we navigate this difficult time. Susan Wachkiki will be missed. Yeah, and the reason why we wanted to uh, read that story and give a shout out to her and her family is because YouTube, for better or worse, whether you like it or not, is profoundly changed how we absorb media in this world. It came out in 2007, and since then, it, it, people there are some people that only watch YouTube inside of TV. They, yeah. they prefer their shows. You know, and Good Mythical Morning is a show my wife watches. They're on thousands of the episodes, and they're YouTube. My girlfriend literally only watches YouTube videos. That's, That's what I'm saying. All she watches. <laughs> and, you know, if you talk to some of the younger generation, they can't even imagine a time where YouTube didn't exist. It's hard for me yeah. to think of a time before YouTube. It does kind of just feel like it's always been there, but it, it hasn't. I there, know. Well, it's, it's weird, so Ryan. We graduated high school before YouTube came out. Two years. Yeah. That'll blow your mind. It, that does blow my mind, dude. Like, we we were the, uh, the what was it, the MySpace and uh, the good Ryan, old, yeah. you were always in my top five, bud. Aww. High five. My, I, MySpace joke. High five. <laughs> All right. Well, you know what? Susan, you will be missed, and thank you for contributing to the platform that has entertained more people than we could ever imagine. I guarantee they had no idea what monster, what awesome monster they created. Holy shit, like, long live YouTube. <laughs> for sure. Earthlink Entertainment Headlines Avatar 3 gets official title. Yeah, yeah, and it's a good title. This comes to us from Variety.com. <laughs> Avatar director James Cameron and stars Zoe Saldana. Zoe Saldana. Zoe Saldana. <laughs> Saldana. Saldana. It has, right. a, it has a little curvy. It does have a little curvy. So I give it a Danya. And Sam Worthington revealed first official title for the third Avatar film on Friday during the D23 Expo. Avatar. Fire and Ash. Okay. I got to be honest. I think it's a pretty badass name. It's sick because it makes sense, right? The way of water. Yeah. The opposite, Fire and Ash. Yeah. Well, hold on, though. If you think that the first movie was either uh, Earth or, you know, because of the tree, or even if it was air because of they were they had the flying mounts, Ooh. then we have water. Now, this one's fire. Air, water, and fire. So that means the the fourth movie, which we know is going to happen, has got to be either air or earth, depending on what you consider the first movie. Joe, that was a great freaking connection. You're right. The first one was totally air because they wrote on the things. Right? 100%. Bam. And they had the floating mountains. So that okay. means that means I'm predicting right now number four will be an avatar tribe where they're living in caves underground. Or space. Well, no. They don't go in space. They might. They don't. Everybody ends up in space eventually. Leprechaun. Jason. Ryan, the Navi don't have space. They're like tribal. Don't ruin the fucking movie. Tribal space. Tribal space. <laughs> <laughs> tribal space. Or no, no. Inner space. <gasps> Hollow Earth, buddy. Ooh. Or was it? Hollow Pandora theory. Booga booga. Booga booga. <laughs> All right, so what, what's new about Avatar 3? Fire and ash. While Cameron didn't preview any footage, he did showcase some concept art from the film, including... Natiri. Thank you. Natiri. Played by Saldana. Riding a Benchy. What, she, what appeared to be a giant airship 
and a first look at a fearsome ash people of the Navi. Covered in ghost-like soot and otherworldly masks as they dance around a giant fire pit. See, that makes sense, right? Fire and ash. So these Navi, it's going to be a tribe that live near a volcano. That makes sense to me. And the, using volcanic ash as face paint, that's badass. That's pretty, that, I mean, yeah, often that's scary. Yeah, you run into a tribe of people, ash on their faces. It doesn't doesn't bode well for anybody else who doesn't have the ash face thing. Yeah, unless it's Wednesday. It's like, so quickly just put it on. Like, like yeah, I'm with you guys. <laughs> You'll see a lot more Pandora than you ever saw before, Cameron says. <laughs> it's it's <laughs> <laughs> Full frontal Pandora. It's an insane adventure and a feast for the eyes. A fucking, you know what movie was a feast for the eyes? What? Fucking uh, Speed Racer. Speed Racer, I think it was 2008 by the Wachowski siblings. That is one of the best movies ever made. And I don't care what anybody says, you can fight me on it. That movie's a feast for the eyes. Back to Pandora. Joe says that's a good movie, so it's a good movie. And he saw it. Ha ha. I only know the old cartoon. Nobody, well, it, dude, that's why that movie is awesome. It is a direct adaptation of the cartoon, and people weren't ready. They weren't ready. Like, as weird as the cartoon was, where it's like they're jumping in the air, and there's these weird, like, flashes in the background and shit. They do that in the movie. That's awesome. It's, I do, it, okay, okay, so maybe I have to watch We're going to watch Speed Race. Because I, sw- I, just, I remember just, I have to win this race, because if I don't win this race, that means I lose this race. And if I lose this race, that means I didn't win, so I have to win. Ha-ha. <laughs> like that was literally every line in that mo- in that show. It was just ridiculous. <laughs> it, anyways, it, back cartoon, to, anyway. anyways, back to James Cameron's Avatar. <laughs> back to James Cameron's Avatar. But it's also got very high emotional stakes, more than ever before. Cameron said during the presentation, "We're going into really challenging territory for all the characters you know and love." Fire and Ash will pick up soon after The Way of Water, as Jake and Natiri encounter the Ash people, who Cameron has hinted are drawn more to violence and power than other clans. They're dicks. <laughs> Don't go close to that clan. Don't go down that clan road. There are new characters, one especially I think you're going to love, or love to hate. The leader of the Ash people, Varang. Cameron said. Wow. Yeah, so I don't know. Everything about that to me sounds really good. It's been a long time that I think it was like 14 years in between the uh, 2009 one. It was a long effing time. And and then the second one, right? So this third one coming out only a few years later, that ain't bad. That's not bad. And I know they're doing at least four. I don't know if they're doing five. So there's another one after this, too. Oh, really? I figured they would stop at a trilogy. No, they're definitely doing at least four. It's like, dude, no, we want more money. Well, apparently, <laughs> uh, I mean, James Cameron said he had this all worked out and he's been planning this all. And uh, if any filmmaker says that, you got to kind of be like, oh, yeah, okay. But James Cameron, I believe him. Yeah. He's I, meticulous. Uh, I I I believe in the Cameron. I'll I'll see it. Uh, I'll admit the first Avatar was eh, you know it was you know it was amazing like, like everything about it was you know groundbreaking and shit but the story was just like kind of me to well, me it was kind of dances with wolves yeah and then the second one i actually i actually really liked the second one like better than the first one i found my only gripe between the two movies is in the first one they're after this weird metal under the great tree called like uh unobtainium and be like oh why didn't they get it well it was unattainable uh, i will I... admit that was like <laughs> the most lazy writing uh but that I didn't understand where in the second movie they're like, we've come back, forgot all about Unobtainium, and now we want whale brain juice because it'll make us immortal. And you're like, uh, all right. Like, I'm going to roll with it, but like, weird switch in motivation, human race. It's like, now we're going to make swords out of this material that you can't clean. It's called Dirtium. <laughs> yeah, right. Like... They're, they're going to go to like Fire and Ash and be like, you know what? We actually want this gas from these volcanoes because they'll fuel our spaceships. And they're called Volcano Ashium. They're called Ashfots. Ashfots. <sighs> <laughs> Anyways, Avatar 3. I'm looking forward to it. You know what else I'm looking forward to, Ryan? What? Do you remember that movie, Megan? I do. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty good. The robot uh, the dance. companion. Yeah. Well, uh, they're doing a spinoff. Well, they're doing Megan too. Don't worry, but they're doing a spinoff. It's called Soulmates with a with an eight there. So S O U L M eight T E, 
And it's kind of like, uh, I'm not going to lie, it's kind of like a Megan, but it's a sex doll. Yep, so it's a little more adult. A little bit more adult, but uh, you know who just got cast was the the girl who, uh, Lily Sullivan, and she was in the new Evil Dead, the Evil Dead Rise, which was a great movie if you haven't seen it. Oh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, yeah it says right here, Evil Dead Rises, Lily Sullivan will star in Megan's spinoff, Soulmate. This comes to us from Rumor.com. Lily Sullivan will play a very grown-up addition to the Atomic Monster Blumhouse AI universe. The two horror companies have announced that she will take the title role in Soulmate, playing an artificially intelligent android a man acquires to help him cope with the loss of his recently deceased wife. According to the PR, needless to say, things go awry with this relationship in frightening ways. The film described as in the tradition of the 90s domestic thrillers, but with a modern technological twist, will be directed by Kate Dolan from You Are Not My Mother, who rewrote the original script by Raphael Jordan from a story by James Wan, who produces with Jason Blum. Yeah, James Wan has done so much stuff. He also did the uh, Aquaman movies. Ingrid Basu and Jordan. Uh, Sullivan shot to horror prominence as Evil Dead Rises beleaguered and ultimately heroic Beth and has also appeared in Greg McLean's Jungle, Matt Vesley's Monolith, there's a monolith again, Uh and the current ministry's version of Picnic at Hanging Rock. Yeah, so she's no slouch. She did really good in Evil Dead Rise. That was the only thing that she's done that I've actually seen. But she she was great in that. She basically played, uh, well, it wasn't like the Ash character, but she was like the main protagonist, I'd say. And in that movie, you're not really sure who the main protagonist is until it, there's only one left. I'm just like, dude, this movie's going to be like every perv's like scariest film ever. Like your yeah. sex what doll if is comes yeah, to your life. real doll starts stabbing you. Oh my you. God, like. I saw you talking to someone today. Like it was the mailman. It's the like, mailman. And then it's gonna be like what futuristic, right? So it's gonna like Bluetooth to his phone, and it's gonna be like, who is she? And it's probably gonna like be sending like messages out and like ruining his life. Like yeah, I, see, I, I fu- can see that shit exactly. Future Shock is a real thing. I mean, Black Mirror made a show about everything that in the future that could creep you out. So this is gonna creep me out. I. God forbid anything ever happens to my wife. I don't know if I could like get a robot that looks like her and just be like, "All right, I'm gonna bag this robot till it doesn't hurt anymore." Pretty much, and that was an episode. That was literally one episode of uh, Black Mirror where they literally like you could grow a clone of a person you had lost. Wow, well, I mean, and it was looks really, like Soulmates kind of taking a page from their book. It was really effed up too. Yeah, Black Mirror is one of those shows where it's like. You really got to take breaks. You can't binge Black Mirror. You'll be so depressed by the end. <laughs> I know. Honestly, I don't like the show for that reason. And yeah. I love anthology shows. My favorite are like the Twilight Zone. All of them. The 80s one, the 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 one that came out in the original in the 60s, even the one that just came out with Jordan Peele. Yeah. My favorite was uh, the 90s Outer Limits because I watched that when I was a kid. That was like my big one. But there, there was even the late 80s show called Monsters, and that was all about, uh, well, Yes, monsters. And, right. And the anthology shows. In my DNA, man, I love that stuff. I grew up on Twilight Zone, Tales from the Crypt. Oh, so, I, mean, I can't believe I didn't call about Tales from the Crypt. Yeah. Yeah, I totally grew up on those. So, yeah, 100%, dude. Uh, so, uh, moving... You know what else we grew up on? Uh, Pixar. Pixar movies. That's and right. you we're actually going to get another Incredibles. Can you believe it? Dude, yeah, the, uh, what was it called? Uh, 23... Uh, the, 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 the fair where they announced everything. Oh, D23. D23. Yeah. Uh, they had a lot of cool announcements. This is one of them. Uh, the Incredibles 3 officially confirmed with Brad Bird returning. He'd have to. He's the mastermind. This comes to us from IGN.com. It's official. The Incredibles 3 is in development with a familiar face on board. Pixar's Pete Doctor announced during D23's Big Friday Night presentation that Brad Bird, writer and director of the first two of the Incredible films, is currently working on the next installment following the beloved Super Family. So cool. Further details, including a release date and a voice cast, were not revealed. The confirmation, while exciting, shouldn't come as a huge shock. 
for those keeping up with Pixar's developments. After a rough few years, a recent Bloomberg report revealed that the company would double down on existing IP like The Incredibles and Finding Nemo as it attempts to rebound at the box office. Inside Out 2's massive success likely only reaffirmed that approach, with the animated sequel officially becoming one of the top 10 highest grossing movies ever worldwide just earlier this month. Yeah, so Pixar, if you guys don't know, during the uh, during the jo- the uh, the Chapek era. Now Chapek, he took over after Bob Iger uh, left as CEO. Chapek comes in, he does his thing, and now Bob Iger's back. But while Chapek was there, he did a couple things, and one of those things was take power away from the creatives and give them to business people. And those business people said, we need more Disney Plus content. That's what matters. And they did the stupid decision to drop a bunch of Pixar movies directly to Disney Plus, <laughs> which makes n- them no money. None. None whatsoever. I mean, you only get money through subscribers, and those subscribers are chances are going to be there or not be there whether you drop that movie or not. It's very hard to tell if that new movie is what got those people to subscribe. So it's very hard to tell if you've even made a difference. So seeing Red, Luca, Soul, all those are... Strange World. Oh, yeah, Strange World. All those are dropped on Disney+. Plus. Well, no, Strange World went to theaters. But those, oh, it did? Yeah. But those three, that's kind of the problem. See, I missed it. That was going to be... Sorry, continue. Yeah, well, the, so basically uh, that happened where it all went to Disney+, Plus and people, like the audience learned, oh, we don't need to go out and see Pixar movies. We can just wait for them to be on Disney+. Plus. And so then the few they did drop, like Strange World, like you were saying, yeah, they, or, but, or Lightyear, they flopped. Right, and, and that was going to be... I was Yeah, I wanted to add that on top of them making that decision... They made they made that decision without making any extra moves in uh, advertising, like because I hardly heard shit about half those movies. Well, it's weird, right? Because if it's a Disney Plus movie, are you putting up the billboards? Like in LA, they do. Like if they put up billboards, they put up uh, bus stop ads. But you know, for instance, here in Detroit, I don't see them advertising movies nearly as much as I think they should. I agree, and like I said, it blew my mind. Like I didn't even know that Strange World was in the movie theaters, and I actually thought that was a pretty good movie. <laughs> like you know, like I I don't know. I thought that was right to Disney Plus. That's crazy. I understood Luca because that was during the pandemic. I believe was when that came. Well, see, that's kind of the point, though. Is doing all these Disney Plus movies. Uh, st- it, it makes it so, of course, those movies weren't making money. So saying that Pixar has had a huge law, it, they haven't in quality. They just right. haven't money because of their dumb choices. Correct. Not it, Pixar, the powers that be. Yes, yes. And uh, so this is um, this is pretty sweet. Uh, so jumping back in here to uh, The Incredibles 3, uh, it says here, The Incredibles 2 arrived in 2018, a full 14 years after the first movie. It proved that there was plenty of appetite left to see the super antics of the Parr family grossing $1.2 billion at the global box office. Damn, I honestly didn't know it made that much money. Neither did I. By the way, uh, just a quick thing. Deadpool just passed the billion-dollar mark, so Deadpool is now a billion-dollar club movie. Bye, 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 bye. Sorry. IGN gave it a 9.2 out of 10, writing at the time that Brad Bird's strong script and direction elevates Incredibles 2 to new heights. The first Incredibles film, of course, was a hit in its own right, grossing $632 million worldwide and winning the Best Animated Film Academy Award. Well, Academy Award aside, I mean, that's pretty good for a new franchise to take home $632 million. Uh, it says here, other Disney movies including Moana 2, Frozen 3, and another Pixar film, Elio got spylights at D23 as well. Yes, and I don't know anything about Elio except that it is aliens in space, so that's right up our alley, and I'm sure I'm going to look forward to that. Uh, I definitely am. You know what else I'm looking forward to? Ooh, would it be Andor Season 2? It might be. Only the best Star Wars series ever. Like, hands down. I mean it. Yeah, no, it is the best Star Wars series ever. So, for those of you who don't know, Andor is a series on Disney+. Plus. It's a live-action Star Wars series, and it takes place, it is a prequel to Rogue One. So, it follows Cassian Andor and his adventures 
as he is uh, in the Rebel Alliance before it's the Rebel Alliance when they're still just rebels and forming the Rebel Alliance. Yeah, and it's it's a great, great show. There's only going to be two seasons. We've already had season one. Season two, this is the update. Enjoy. These Rogue One fan favorites are officially returning for Andor Season 2. This comes to us from Collider.com. Disney dropped an exciting news update about Andor Season 2 at D23, much to the delight of fans of the critically acclaimed Star Wars series. At D23, we were given our first glimpse at the second season of the series, which included a look at two returning characters from Rogue One. Ben Mendelson. Ben Mendelson. Thank you. Ben, ben Mendelson joined the series as Krennic, after playing Koi when confronted with the prospect earlier in the year during an interview earlier this year with Collider's Maggie Lovett. Yeah, basically he was dodging it. Like, I, 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 I might come back, but you know, now we know he is officially back. Awesome. We also saw a tease of a return <laughs> for K2SO. Awesome. The exurbit droid character played memorably by Alan Tudyk in the film, with Tudyk also returning to a galaxy far, far away. Show creator Tony Gilroy had previously stated including K2SO was one of the responsibilities of the second season. Absolutely, because, uh, spoiler, but the movie came out in 2015, guys. Uh, Rogue One, K2SO dramatically sacrifices himself at the end of that film. Um, And you really like Alan Tudyk's characterization of a robot that is this droid he is an imperial droid but he has been reprogrammed by the rebel alliance to serve the rebels and he's just the perfect kind of caddy i love that that robot i love him as a voice actor and 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 as an actor in general they they say i heard that that slap when he slaps him in rogue one and he's like and there's a fresh one if you don't if you continue to talk or whatever i heard i don't know if that's true or not that was ad-libbed and i and and you can actually see the actor playing and or like break gets, care like yeah, gets laugh a little like, like laugh a little bit yeah <laughs> like if you and if you i i watch the scene again and it does look like he he cracks you do see him like holy shit like when he gets down so i don't know that that was funny to me oh man so uh so season 2 of andor will continue to follow cassian andor portrayed by diego luna as he evolves from a disillusioned cynic to a pivotal figure in the Rebel Alliance. The first season captivated audiences with its gritty and grounded depiction of the Star Wars universe. Yeah, it felt like that you felt the wars in Star Wars for once. What it was like to just be a, a commoner. Focusing on the espionage and moral complexities faced by the necessant rebellion against the Galactic Empire. The second season is expected to further explore these themes and bring Cassian closer to the events of Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Given that Andor serves as a prequel to Rogue One, the second season is likely to set up significant plot points such as Cassian's deeper involvement with the Rebel Alliance and his role in discovering the Death Star plans. The season finale might introduce key characters from Rogue One or hint at the mission that will eventually lead to the events of the film. Tony Gilroy, the mastermind behind the series, will write the first three episodes. Known for his work on the Bourne series and his pivotal role in Rogue One, a Star Wars story. Yeah, the fact that he worked in the Bourne series really really shows in this, because it's got that kind of gritty, yeah. yeah, spy thriller feel to it. Definitely. Gilroy has been instrumental in shaping the dark espionage-filled story of Andor. His expertise in crafting tension-filled, character-driven stories will kick off the season. Following Gilroy, Beal Williamson, Williamson, William, bleh, Beal William, William, Williman, Williman, Williman. I have just never. I don't know why I wanted to say Williamson. That's what it looked like. Williman, known for creating the political thriller House of Cards will take the reins for the next three episodes. Williman's experience in political dramas makes him an excellent choice for the exploring the power struggles between the Rebel Alliance and the Galactic Empire. 
Yeah, man. Very Game of Thrones, this show. It's all about chess. Yes. The third arc will be penned by Dan Gilroy, Tony Gilroy's brother, and an accomplished writer and director best known for Nightcrawler. Not to be confused with the Nightcrawlers. <laughs> no, one, no one's confusing <laughs> it with the Nightcrawlers, right? Rounding out the season, Tim Bissell will write the final three episodes. Bissell, an accomplished writer and video game story designer, has worked on critically acclaimed games like Gears of War 4 and Uncharted 4, A Thief's End. Andor Season 2 is expected to premiere on Disney Plus in 2025. Uh, I wish we had a closer date, like an actual, like, uh, you know, but I think it probably, like, think about it. It's going to be May the 4th. Like, when else are you going to release that? Yeah, it's, that's probably true. It's going to take a while, I, and I don't want them to rush. I'm in no rush. Make it good. They've already filmed it, so it's really just about, you know, ed- the editing and the special effects now, and I, uh, I'm i here for it. You know what I mean? We get Skeleton Crew on December 3rd, so yeah. it, so we'll be we'll be good. So that makes sense that they would do and or after that. I'm excited for that one, Skeleton Crew. We, we just learned about that last week. Kate Blanchett says, no one got paid anything to film Lord of the Rings. <laughs> I basically got free sandwiches. What? I mean, it makes sense. It was a really big independent film. It was done by New Line. They did all of them at once. It was considered a huge risk risk at the time. And they mostly got no-name actors. I guess I really didn't think about it that way. Yeah. This comes to us from Variety.com. The Lord of the Rings is one of the highest-grossing film series of all time, having grossed $2.9 billion worldwide. But, according to Kate Blanchett, that doesn't necessarily mean the actors earned a handsome salary for their involvement in Peter Jackson's film trilogy. During Watch What Happens Live on Tuesday night, host Andy Cohen asked Blanchett what film she received the biggest paycheck for. I think it's probably Lord of the Rings, Cohen guessed. Are you kidding me? Blanchett replied. No, no one got paid anything to do that movie. When Cohen asked her if she got a piece of the back end, Blanchett replied, no, that was way before any of that. No, nothing. I wanted to work with the guy who made Brain Dead. she continued, referring to Jackson and his 1992 zombie comedy film, which was released as Dead Alive in North America. I, I love, love that Dead movie. Alive. Yeah. <laughs> well, we've mentioned that movie on the podcast before. That movie's so good. I had no idea that that was his work. Yeah. Peter Jackson, no director shit. of Lord of the Rings. I learned something new again today. Blanchett starred in Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy as Galadriel, a royal elf in Middle Earth who possesses powerful magical abilities. And uh, Galadriel is also the main character in the Rings of Power series that is on uh amazon and a lot of people didn't like the first uh season but dude season two the trailer looks freaking amazing and they're even bringing in tom bombadil tom bombadil hell yeah (laughs) the oscar winning actor not tom bombadil reprised (laughs) her role in the director's hobbit film series a prequel to the lord of the rings which i bet she got paid a lot more for and definitely got stuff on the back end yes Blanchett is not the only Lord of the Rings star who has expressed how low their pay was for the fantasy epic. In a 2019 interview on The Howard Stern Show, Orlando Bloom, who plays Legolas, said he was paid just $175,000 for all three movies. I basically got free sandwiches, and I got to keep my elf ears, Blanchett said to of her Lord of the Rings salary on Watch What Happens Live. Blanchett appeared on Watch What Happens Live alongside Gina Gershon to promote the sci-fi film Borderlands in theaters Friday, which I heard not such great things, but I don't want to talk trash because I haven't seen it yet, and I haven't even played the video game, so I I, I don't know. It might not bum me out because I don't know the lore. Okay, well, it had a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Since then, it's gotten up to a 10% on Rotten Tomatoes, and Borderlands, from what I hear, it just it had a lot of... Uh, interference and kind of feels like the whole thing was written by AI which it wasn't to be clear but I mean it's got that robotic feel like this is what you're supposed to do in this kind of movie once again like Ryan said I have also not seen it 
And I'm looking forward to seeing it because I don't mind paying for a bad movie because I enjoy really weird movies. So I will see it, and I will tell you my thoughts then. I've seen clips already, and honestly, it looks good. Well, you know, just sometimes movies that don't go over very well, in my opinion, are some of the fun best movies. There's this movie called uh, Mortal Engines, which Peter Jackson, speaking of which, uh, produced. And it came out in 2019, I think, in December. And it was this huge, based on a young adult series, huge movie. I imagine at least a couple hundred thousand, a uh, hun- couple hundred million dollar budget, where there are cities like like London and other things that traverse the world on like they're like giant trucks that like have cities on the back of them. It's very weird, but the point is, weird movies sometimes are the best. You know what else was good? The belated Tron sequel, Tron Legacy. Yes, and our sixth headline here says... That we're going to talk about the third belated Tron movie. Tron Ares. The programs invade the real world. All right, so Tron Ares, guys. That's Tron 3. I'm excited. This comes to us from IGN.com. The first trailer for Tron Ares was shown during the Disney Entertainment Showcase at D23 2024, offering fans their big look at the anticipated sequel to Tron and Tron Legacy. Jeff Bridges took the stage at D23 2024 to share new info about the film, saying it's a beautiful time to bring the venerable franchise back. We made the original in 1982. It's hard to believe. It's amazing, too. We never thought it would have this legacy that's continued on, Bridges said. And here we are. What a beautiful time to bring it back, with technology and AI being omnipresent in our lives. The perfect time to revisit this amazing world, to have this amazing world visit us. That's what happens in our movie. You know, I could imagine that as uh, Jeff Bridges from The Dude, Like, that's what I was imagining the whole time is the Big Lebowski version of Jeff Bridges saying that whole little speech there. Just ride the bike, man. (laughs) Tron Ares was previously revealed in a first look image featuring a menacing red suit. Yeah, kind of looks like a weird superhero, super soldier villain. Looks cool. I mean, it looks similar to the other ones, but it's got a biker helmet on it, which, Yeah. uh, yeah. The official plot summary reads... Tron Ares follows a highly sophisticated program, Ares, who is sent from the digital world into the real world on a dangerous mission, marking humankind's first encounter with AI beings. During the Disney Entertainment Showcase, Bridges confirmed that filming was finished on the new movie as co-stars Greta Lee, Evan Peters, and Jared Leto talked about their characters, Leto joked that he never signed an NDA and said he would play Ares Master Controller, a villain who wants to make the real world his own permanently. Yeah, I could see him playing a villain. He's he's a good villain, I gotta be honest. I don't love J- everything Jared Leto does, but when he, uh, no matter what he does, you gotta give him credit, he, he goes in as hard as he can. He is, he is like a freak of nature when it comes to that. He does. He goes all in. Say what you will. Very committed. Following, a method actor. In, to the T, he is a method actor. <laughs> Following the introduction, the first trailer for Tron Ares was shown. It features a man gazing at the stars and wondering if he's alone, only to realize that intelligent life has existed all along with AI and tech. There is something at work inside my soul I do not understand. I came here to find something, Ares says during the trailer. Something important. Permanence. We see Ares walking through the real world following by a big Tron ship in the sky. Tron bike paths in the real world. Battles with staffs, discs being thrown, and more. It finishes with Bridges appearing in a white robe with the line... Greetings, program. What's even more exciting is the confirmation that Nine Inch Nails will be handling the soundtrack. While no new release info was shown, we do know the long-awaited sequel is slated 
to be released sometime in 2025. And see, that is really cool. Nine Inch Nails, Trent Reznor doing the entire soundtrack because the last movie, uh, Daft Punk, did the entire soundtrack. So they're like kind of sticking with the whole, uh, the whole music artist doing. I don't know the music and industrial and techno. I mean, I'm down. And what is cool is that they're actually saying the band Nine Inch Nails is doing the soundtrack because Trent Reznor was actually used before. He was involved with the soundtrack for Soul. Oh yeah, for 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 Pixar. Okay, so yeah, so th- they're they're making the distinction that the band themselves is working on it, not just Trent Reznor. Exactly, and I actually think that's really important and good for them. That's that's awesome news. That is awesome news. I mean, the D twenty three Expo, it's kind of like Comic Con for all things Disney, and they made a lot of announcements. Uh, they also released a few trailers. Ryan and I got to talk a little bit. We're going to tell you guys about our feelings. Uh, the Skeleton Crew trailer. Yeah. Yeah. So Skeleton Crew is a new live action uh, Star Wars show that comes out December 3rd. Uh, how did you feel about the trailer, Ryan? I thought that it, I'm, I'm excited for it because it looks like 100% new. It is like, this is, this is no origin story. Yeah, we've never felt a show like this before. And uh, I like the young protagonist. It felt like Super 8 from, uh, you know, the J.J. Abrams movie or or E.T. or Goonies or any of that, like, Stand By Me bullshit. And this is a great way to jump into the Star Wars universe and not having to know a thing because it's like a completely new story. Exactly. I heard that the show takes place during the Mandalorian era era of, of uh, Star Wars. I'm not sure exactly, but that is what I've heard. And it, it seems to follow a group of young kids who are living on a planet, and they find a buried ship of some sorts. And it kind of seemed like maybe they got in it, and it launched, and then they were lost in space. So it's like speak. so classic. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. Yeah. I like, I like that. I think that's going to be good. I'm excited for that one. Definitely. You know what else I'm excited for? Actually, I'm not going to tee it up like that. I'm not excited for this. I'm not unexcited for it. Uh, It's more of just a a thing. Apparently, Dwayne The Rock Johnson is doing a film called Monster Jam, which uh, is about the drivers of monster trucks. I can see it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I can see it. It'll, It'll be good. It'll 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 be a fun family adventure. It'll be like Jungle Cruise. I love The Rock. I can't even talk shit. I love that man. You know, I tell you what though, I would have watched this as a kid. I remember. Do you remember the commercials like Sunday, Sunday, Sunday at the Silver Dome? I don't remember Monster Jam. I remember it on radio all the time. Like if I back when I used to actually listen to the radio stations, yeah, like that would always be playing. I went to a monster truck rally once, and I was a I was a young kid. I mean, I we're talking between seven and twelve. I do not know exactly when it was, but it was an indoor stadium, and you could still smoke. So between the car exhaust and every like crazy hillbilly smoking, I can't breathe. It was it was a really weird <laughs> weird time, but it was fun. There was a lot of cars it's going like from. I, I think I've developed the black lung. <laughs> <laughs> it, I don't what in. Well, I'm obsessed with Star Wars helmets, and I was excited to see they made, along with all these shows and shit and movies, they D23 also... D23 talks about their merchandise. Yeah, and uh, so they released the Kylo Ren helmet, which looks like it was really screen accurate, and I guess it, like, turns on, and, like, it even has, like, all the red cracks in it, like, from uh, Rise of Skywalker. Yeah, after it was broken and re-put together. I'm surprised they didn't have a Kylo Ren helmet before. Me too. Like, they had, like, I think just cheap masks, you know what I mean? Not the full helmet. And this isn't done by Hasbro Pulse, which has been doing, like, most of the helmets that I buy. This was actually straight up through the Disney store. And uh, oh. they also released the dagger. I forget what it's called. The dagger of something. The one like, she holds up and just happens to just happens, happens to be the same map. To we're, we're not even going to talk about the science. It's of okay. Corrosion we're... of metals from the waves. The fact that it would not be the same shape after so long. Don't so worry about it, Ryan. It was the mortis. No it was the all. mortis gods. The mortis gods did it. So that's why I did not even like. And they wanted eighty dollars for that dagger replica. But you got the helmet. I got the helmet. That was $139.99 for the helmet. And I jumped in because they uh, they said, you know, it goes live at 11 o'clock on that uh, just uh, the other day. And I signed in 10 minutes before 11. And it actually put me into a waiting room. And I was there 10 minutes before 11. And I was at position like 2,000. 
Yeah, that's not surprising, man. It's like I tried to get Comic Con tickets before and ended up in like this weird long waiting list. It's it's some when everyone wants it, it's a tough deal. But to their credit, I've I've kind of talked shit a little on Hasbro World where they'll sell something and they don't even have a freaking like all the products. Like when you look at the picture, we're making the, this in theory in the bottom corner. It says an AI generated image. Actual product may vary. <laughs> like to Disney's credit, it's my, like buying something on Wish. Right, and I just bought my helmet. I just paid for the helmet uh, for the Kylo Ren one the other day. It's co- it'll be there Sunday. So to their credit, at least they're selling something they have. With Hasbro Pulse, they're like, we're totally going to make this. I, we will give yeah. it to you next. Waiting list is next year. Literally, September 2025 is when I'm going to get it, and I bought that shit over a month ago. Oh, man. Well, uh, not to jump ship on the on the merchandise, but you know what else is coming out that I think is pretty cool? Because I'm a film guy, obviously. Went to film school, loved film. Yeah. Uh, Inside Out is doing a Disney Plus series called Dream Productions. Very cool. And I don't know if you realize this, but uh, in the first Inside Out movie, when they're on their travels through Riley's head, they come across uh, her dreams where people do dreams and it's set up like a movie studio. Right. And yeah. that is what this show is. So it's, I like that. Yeah. So it's the movie studio inside her head. It's going to take place in between Inside Out 1 and 2. And considering Inside Out just is in the top 10 most profitable films ever made you have to assume this is going to be a good series that at least isn't going to be smirched the 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 the, the, what they got going on i don't know no i i think that's a great idea there's so much to do with inside out and they say inside out has actually been like really beneficial when it comes to like therapy and Uh, stuff when it comes to young kids i know the second one yeah Yeah. with anxiety they've a lot of people have come out and spoken about how it was helping them so that's awesome. So so it's a that's great. Well, yeah, Dream Productions, I, I imagine it, and I have no idea. This is just my guess, but I imagine it being a little bit of a anthology series with the Dream Productions being almost like a uh, a framing device for each episode. I That's what I want out of it, but who knows what we'll get. But I'm here for it. And what do you think with, uh, you know, so they showed Stitch pop out of the screen, and he was all CGI. Do you think they'll do him, like, with... Like live action people, or do you think the whole thing will be CGI? No. Uh, so we'll, we'll jump back into that. Another thing they announced is they're doing a live action remake of Stitch and uh, Lilo and Stitch. No, I imagine it's going to be a situation where we have real actors and a CGI Stitch. That's what I was thinking, like Sonic. Kinda. Yeah, like Sonic. Exactly like Sonic. Okay. Yeah. Okay. It's crazy. It, uh, there just so many things were announced. Uh, not surprisingly, they're even going to do a Toy Story 5. I was actually kind of shocked at that because the last one ended on such an interesting note. But I guess it only if they're going to do five, they're going to have to do six, too. But, I mean, there's so much they could do, I guess, with, like, there's always new lessons to teach, I guess. You know, and, I mean, you're talking Toy Story, which was the original Pixar. Oh, yeah, it was the original Pixar full-length film. They, right. They did shorts and stuff. You know what? Uh... So this one, what we're going to do is the last one, Toy Story 4, ended where Woody was left. He was hanging out in a carnival with Bo Peep, and the other toys went off with Bonnie, and there was a separation. So we're going to have to get all our toys back together, for one. I mean, I am, I assume that they could do that, and then they could they could do so much more. Heck, with they could do a whole new thing with whole new toys if they wanted to. Like, well, they could, but they're not gonna. They did show images in a teaser, and Woody and everybody, they're all, all back together. I mean, yeah, for five, I mean, but but I mean, like, if they're gonna do six, I could see them basically doing, like, a whole new whole new set. Sure. I have no theory on six. I'll, they're, they're just throw it just out re- there. They just released five. I mean, they just talked about five, and you know what it's gonna be, though, Ryan? Huh. Toys versus tech. That makes sense. So it, it, the the poster that they showed is a bunch of the characters, Woody and Buzz, all looking sad at the edge of the bed, while the kid is tented in his bed looking at an iPod. Yep, looking at like a tablet or something. Yep, that's what I figured. And uh, so that makes sense because yeah, how uh, that's that's the thing is like I, I try to get my kids to play with their toys and not play with their you know get off the screen. Yeah, lim- limiting screen time is so tough nowadays because everything's on a damn screen. Everything. So that you can't even argue with them, right? Like, uh, but no, another one that was announced actually that I'm really looking forward to because I love the first one was Zootopia two. Oh yeah, I love that first one. I honestly did. That was one of my kids' favorites. It was one of my favorites. I yeah, like that movie. It was a good movie. I uh, it was 
basically about racism, wasn't it? Right? They were talking about how like we need to trust predators, and they're not inherently violent, like predators versus prey. Yeah, yeah it I'm, was like with that. There was like the I division. Mean, they, they, they do that a lot, though. They did that with Elemental too. And they had like a lot of like a lot of human problems with animals, like you know, like her trying, her trying to fit in, you know, getting on a school, like like you know, being like the first bunny cop, and there was like a whole. There's like a stigma against her as a bunny, and like they yeah. like you know, and so like there is a lot, and then there was a stigma against the fox because he's a fox because no one trusts foxes, so it's like, so where yeah, so it's like it's asking like where in society is the line drawn, I guess, and I thought it was pretty deep. I thought it was it was a good message. I thought, I thought it was too, and I remember that uh, what's her name, Shakira played. Uh, gazelle gazelle yeah uh, and the, that was like the big song try I... everything oh 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 yeah Sorry. exactly no it's fine <laughs> um i i don't know what can we expect from this second though what do you think the next story I- I- is you know like where do you go from here uh you know i guess the import the the way they could go is what if they ended up like going into like politics or something like because she's a police officer she gets him as a police officer what if like maybe she's chief or he's chief in this one like someone new will be chief and then like maybe someone get needs to be the new mayor or something like that or maybe even beyond that like i don't know like because the whole thing last time was the mayor police chief police force like city problems. Yeah. So now you're thinking we might go like politics like co- problems, country problems. Like yeah, you go expand even further. Well, Zootopia, Zootopia is just a city, right? And right. if it's called Zootopia, maybe is Zootopia like the capital of the world, or is it the country? What, what what's happening? Do we know? Are we getting into that? I think Zootopia was Zootopia because like in most sections of the world, like or whatever in this you know in this universe, like yeah, there there's a place where there's rabbits. There's a place where there's Foxes. There's a place. Oh where my god! So you think every country has a different animal, and like they're not almost, just living intermingly? Like maybe? I don't know. I don't know. It's never really explained. We're just asking questions. But no, I can't say that because when she was in school, it was all different kinds of animals in the beginning. Oh, so yeah. that doesn't track, and that wasn't Zootopia. So I don't know. I don't know. Zootopia two is definitely happening, and the guy who played Short Round in Indiana Jones Temple of Dune, uh, K One Han. I don't know his name. I tried looking it up, but my phone wasn't getting reception. Uh, he's going to play a snake. So he's coming back. Nice. And he was also in Loki. Yes, he was two. Loki season two and everything everywhere all at once is where he won his Oscar. Hell yeah. No, he's, he's awesome. Well, just a few other things. Uh, they announced stage plays too. So frozen is getting a musical, which it makes sense. That'll work. Uh, Hercules is getting a musical in England. They're nice. doing nice. And, uh, they're doing the greatest showman, which was a movie musical, which I didn't realize. I assumed it was already a stage musical, oh. but I guess it's going backwards. Oh, it was I a thought movie. it was a play. And now, well, now it is. Oh, I love the greatest showman like that. I love that effing. I wonder if they could ever get Hugh to actually reprise his role for the stage. I think if they wanted to, they they could. They'd have to build, get a back uh, a dump truck full of money up to his house, but he he's from the world of theater. Like he yes. comes from Broadway. So I think they at least maybe for a performance he would do it. Uh, uh just another thing, they uh, they announced Frozen 2. Uh excuse me, a Frozen 3 and 4. Crazy. We only showed concept art of 3 and they very smallly hinted, "Oh yeah, we're doing 4 too." But like that makes sense. It does make sense. It's it's a huge hit. Like kid, like young girls everywhere love Frozen. Like you that's, still. That's see why the Elsa. stage play also makes sense. You see Elsa in Anna costumes every year. Like every Halloween, I always see Elsa's walking around. Like they're my my niece. She has El, you know Elsa shit. She loves that movie. She loves Olaf. Like uh, they I'm... really did it right for uh, little girls. Like they love and, and and I'm sure a lot of young boys too. But and. Yeah, no, it was just a, a good Disney movie is a good Disney movie. And what's good about this is it's family friendly. Uh, I will say, though, I am sick of hearing everything frozen. I can't I can wait for this sequel to come out because yeah. I'm done. I mean, I guess at the end of the day, I just got to let it go. Ah! I thought the second one was really, <laughs> really bad. Well, the third and fourth one will probably be amazing. Now, the question is, is the 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 quality of the second one not being as good? Will that affect the third one or is it going to be a big hit? I hope it affects it in a good way because the second one, in my opinion, just wasn't that great. So hopefully with the third one, they try to be better. That's my hope. There you go. Uh, They also showed Marvel 
uh, released Daredevil Born Again, the trailer for the new show, cool. which we now know is a continuation of the Netflix show. And in this trailer, they revealed the return of John Barenthal as the Punisher. The best Punisher. Oh, yeah, but he's back. He's canon. He's in the MCU, and this trailer confirms it. That's excellent. I like that because I really enjoyed uh, the Punisher series. I'll admit, I wasn't. I went into it with too much expectation. It was good. It wasn't like amazing, but it was good. But you think at first you just you expected too much from I it. I thought I was going to be blown away, and by the end I was like, oh, that was good. Well, yeah. yeah, those Netflix they didn't have the budget those Netflix shows, but they were really good with uh, their contained street level kind of superhero. Je- Jessica Jones was definitely the best. Jessica Jones was the best. Um, I didn't like Iron Fist. Luke Cage was good for the Luke f- Cage was great. The, the first season was great. Yes, yes. Second season was was pretty crazy. It was a little different. Uh, I only saw season one of The Punisher. Uh, that was good. And Daredevil was of course great. I honestly didn't care for Daredevil. I, that or Iron Fist. I agree with the Iron Fist. Uh, but Defenders with all of them together, that was sweet. I, I like the Defenders. I miss Defenders. You know what's funny is I even bought the Defenders because there was that weird moment where it was taken off of Netflix and it wasn't yet on Disney+. Plus. And for a short time, I was able to buy them digitally on Vudu. So I bought all three seasons of Jessica Jones and the Defenders. Uh, and yeah, I still haven't seen the Defenders. I want to say Jessica Jones season two. That's like when she like has like a weird fling with Luke Cage. And since he's indestructible and no, she's that's super... season one. Was that season one? Yeah. And she's super strong. They're basically just banging around her apartment, just destroy. She's just throwing him around. Yeah, and they're both just <laughs> destroying the apartment. You know what, Ryan? Like I said, they were good with some street level combat. It was those Jessica Jones. I want to give that another run because that was that was such a good show. It was a good show, and I think she will return to the MCU as well because not everyone is confirmed. But you could assume since they brought back Vincent D'Onofrio as Kingpin, obviously we have every character from. Uh, Daredevil returning. That you got to assume that Jessica Jones may be shortly following. She's such a great actress, and I, you know, I just I'm, I'm watching Kristen Ritter. I'm watching Breaking Bad for the first time. Oh, and yeah, I, she plays she, Jesse's she plays, girlfriend. Oh my god, and and what a she did such a great job. Like, ugh, I don't want to know. I mean, the, the show's old, so spoiler alert on Breaking Bad when she died. Oh, my God. It was rough. That was rough. rough. I've never seen uh, all of Breaking Bad, but I've seen that scene a few times because of uh, me being a fan of Kristen Ritter's work, you know, being like, what the hell show is this? And Walt could have saved her. He could have turned her over, but she choked on her vomit right in front of him, and he didn't turn her over to save her because because he wanted wanted Jesse to get his mind back on cooking. To be fair, he's a practical businessman. Uh, Dude, Walter (laughs) is fucked. He is such a like it. it he are it, without him, like everybody's lives would have been much better in this show. Like he literally is <laughs> hot a really, take on an old show, guys. He is a really bad person. <laughs> All right, and the final thing we're gonna mention uh, released at D twenty three. Unless you had something else. No, I uh, I'll, I'll with the with Marvel. They also released a really cool uh, Iron Man helmet for Ooh. merchandise, but Ooh. I I I didn't want to. I got so many Star Wars shit. But I, I'm like, you can't I'm like, jump I can't, into Marvel too. I, I gotta stay with it. I gotta stick with it. I understand. I started collecting the High Republic, and I just, I, I, I can't not get it all now. There's but, so much. All right, guys. And the final thing we're gonna talk about, like I said, is they released the live action trailer for Snow White. This has been a long time coming. There's been a lot of. I want to say, dare I say, controversy surrounding this film. There's been a little bit. Uh, Peter Dinklage mentioned uh, that he thought it was atrocious uh, use of, you know, of little people. They're CGIing uh, dwarves. He was like, haven't we come to a place in society? Haven't I done enough for my people, essentially? He had a quote that I'm misquoting. But um, And I respect his opinion. I don't. Know? I don't. I, no, I res- he can have an opinion. That's what I'm saying. I don't agree with him. Well, the problem is these are not dwarves as in midgets or little people. I'm not trying to be offensive. I'm just saying they're magical creature version of dwarves. They are literally magical mythical creatures. This is like this is like a skinny albino being pissed off at the depiction of elves. Correct. And and no, <laughs> and that's what I'm saying. I respect his opinion because he's a little person, you know. I can't say anything uh, you know, against what he has to say about it. But yes, m- uh, from my opinion, I agree with you. Snow White and the Seven Dwarves is not saying dwarves, like you said, like little people. It's about mythical creatures that have been in folklore. We we cover so much folklore in this podcast. So if you listen, you understand what we're trying to say here. It's like, so 
you know, we I never agreed with the controversy. I thought the film should have just like like Bennett's thing. And and then I heard another uh, actor who's a little person be like, you know, kind of bashing on what Peter did. He's like, way to take away some work for some of us, bro. Yeah, well, that's like, kind of the thing, right? Yeah, like we literally that could have been a shoe in for for a, you know a lot of really good little people actors. Well, I mean, they are CGI. They are completely CGI. Yeah. So chances are it would be a little person performing for on set and then CGI'd over. But it might not have been if Peter didn't have such a freaking strong viral comment about it. I don't know. It's hard to say. It is hard to say. But you know what? I do want to make the comment that uh, Gal Gadot plays the evil queen, and I've never seen any more perfect casting. She looks so much like the evil queen, like the old 19- nineteen. Where's she from? Uh, Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, sweet. Well, she looks so much like the evil queen. It is, and she is beautiful. And it's funny because she's like, you know, like Mira Mira on the wall. Who's the fairest one of them all? And I'm just like, no offense to the actress playing Snow White, but you. <laughs> you don't you don't got shit to worry about, Gal Gadot. You're good. You are the fairest one. <laughs> it's just like you just you just bring that thing home and you're just like mirror, mirror on the wall. Like <laughs> yeah. who's the fairest one of all? You nice. You nice. 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 All right. <laughs> <laughs> like, but no, yeah, uh, so holy crap, man. Like, honestly, this is uh how many a lot of great announcements a lot of great sequels there's gonna be another one that we didn't cover where it's like a girl who turns into a beaver yeah it's called hopping or hoppers yeah hoppers i think is what it was so yeah, and, that's uh, another her, she's she gets her brain transferred into a beaver and i'm not sure if she could transfer her brain into several different creatures or just the beaver but yeah that's a thing so that was teased so we get new movies as well because i know a lot of the jokes was you get a sequel you get a sequel like the oprah meme like like everyone gets a sequel to be fair there's also prequels did you you know they released yeah. the trailer for mufasa that's right the lion king prequel which uh seth rogan is returning as pumba just saying Hey, say what you want, man. That movie in 2019, the the CGI Lion King. For some reason, people call it the live action Lion King. It's not. That was all CGI animation. Yeah. But the point is, uh, John Fever, right? It is the highest grossing animated film ever. Now it's funny if you Google what the highest grossing animated film is, it this movie won't come up because they don't consider it an animated movie. It is. And if you look at its box office, it is the highest grossing animated film. And that wasn't it John Favreau? Yes, it was John Favreau. And he previously did, before this, a very similar uh, style film for... Jungle Book. Jungle Book. And that was Which great. Which was also Disney. That was really good. Well, those two things got him the Mandalorian. And now they are doing another thing that was announced. Yes. The Mandalorian and Grogu movie. Which... Woo! The reason why I wasn't going to bring it up is because they didn't really, I mean, yeah, we knew this movie was coming. So it's just reconfirming that this is happening, which is great. I didn't get to see the video they teased, but I did get to see some clips. Like I saw, we're going to get snow troopers back live action for the first time since Empire Strikes Back, which okay. is pretty cool. Okay. I, I mean, saw... it's, it, we haven't really had a snowy planet except for the first episode of Mandalorian was the only one I could think of. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. And, uh, and and later on, Amando, when they got stuck on that ice planet with all the crazy ice spiders and shit, when he was with the frog lady with her all of her eggs. Oh, sure, sure, that sure. Was that but at that time, time, let's be fair, in the timeline, the Empire had fallen. So Correct. the only way you would get a snow trooper in that sense, ooh, what if it was like a, 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 a group that was sent off in this far outpost and they didn't even know the war was over? Like <laughs> yes. like when you find the the island of the Japanese soldiers who still think it's World War Two yes. kind of thing? Dude, yeah, like I could just like, like, like for oh, the Empire, it's like the Empire's dead. <laughs> I've been I've freezing my nuts off for it's 15 like the, years for no fucking reason. It's like the second Death Star blew up. The second Death Star? Wait a minute, what? What the hell? Like, we there was a second one? <laughs> I told you you yeah, should have fixed the fax machine. And then I saw uh, we got Zeb coming back, and it looks like maybe a more of a, um, a bigger role because he was in the cockpit flying uh in this one zeb being from rebels yes so zeb is an alien uh rebel from like ryan just said rebels the cartoon show well he made his live action premiere in uh mandalorian season three he was only in yep. an opening scene at the bar but it looks like he like ryan said he'll be involved in the movie and then we even get like the cool little i forget what they're called but the funny little mechanics guys like no eat the broken eat the broken <laughs> like we get those guys back we got like an image with grogu with two of them so I love those guys. So we get them back. I hope we get back. What's her name? Uh, uh, from Strangers with Candy, 
who played uh, Amy Sanders or something like that. Yeah, because honestly, she killed it. In uh, she was like one of my favorite characters in Mandalorian. You do realize that, like, I don't know why are we keep going back to Tatooine though. Like that's what I'm saying. Like she's just it's because she's on Tatooine. You know what I mean? She needs to get off of Tatooine so we don't have to keep going back to Tatooine. That's all I'm saying. I think it's because isn't it? It's the biggest port on the Outer Rim. Like it's not considered really a part. Of the Repub- that's why Republic credits don't work. I don't work. know, dude. In the original Star Wars, it was described as the farthest place from anything. And you're going to tell me now it's a big old port. I don't know. Whatever. Well, it is a- kind of a big port. And yeah, like, you know, because remember with Watto, when he was trying, he offered credits. He's like, Republic credits don't do any good here. Yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, that's, man, that's D23 for you. It's Hell yeah. A lot. It's basically like we said, the Comic-Con for Disney, and we there was a lot to cover today. So if, if you felt as though we went through anything too quick, we're sorry. We were just trying to keep a contained show. There was so much, and I'm going to bring my helmet for next week's show, and I'm going to wear it. I'm gonna, we're going to play around with it. I'll give my little review of it, since this is my first helmet that's not Hasbro Pulse. So I'm interested. Awesome. Yeah, I want to see that helmet. We're bringing the Kylo Ren. We'll take a picture. We'll even put it on the thumbnail, bud. Yeah, that'd be great. All right, guys. Well, you know what? That's the end of our show, and this is episode 50. Holy shnikes. Yes. So uh, thank you so much for listening and being a listener. If you'd love to support the show, we would love you, too. Uh, Just download the episode wherever it is that you access Earthling Entertainment. Just hit that download money money that download button it that, it's money is what i was gonna say right 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 well you know and uh like joe said yes please downloads are the best way to support us if you want to help us out it's really that easy make sure you download uh we're available on spotify uh, uh audible you know yeah, i download us on audible apple podcast and, is a good one. Oh yeah and uh we have a new email now it's earthling entertainment podcast at gmail.com. We that will be checking the, that regularly now. Yes, that is the best way to get a hold of us. So if you want to contact the show, Earthling Entertainment at uh, Earthling Entertainment Podcast at gmail.com. Yep. And uh, of course, if you want to hit us up on Facebook, you can message us there as well. And remember to follow us. We're on TikTok, we're on Instagram, Facebook. Uh, can't seem to get our X account to work, but uh, who I'll, cares? We're I'll, getting rid of that X account. <laughs> I'll cross that We're bridge. We're just when deleting I get to it. that thing. We uh, don't like it. It's yeah, f it. Why We're not? gonna get a uh, threads, but yeah, all right, we, guys. Uh, we might. We, we just, might. We might. All right, guys. So from all of us here at Earth League Entertainment, thanks for listening, and see ya. We leave in peace, but we come in pieces. I don't. I don't even know what that means. I was trying to think of something funny. You know, it didn't work. It was close. It was close. It was close I thought to you were funny. gonna. I thought you were gonna get really dirty with it. I'm gonna admit. Yeah, at at was, first, my yeah. brain was like, "Oh, whoa, whoa!" Joe's really going heavy for the end. Sometimes you just back yourself into a corner, and you just have to keep talking until you find yourself into. Oh, wait, into the show. Bye. Bye. <laughs>